All right, so we're back. We are game 2005, and it is the fall 2017 semester, and we are week nine, I guess, part two of our broadcast. We just finished talking about assignment two and a bit of circular motion, and now we're just going to get into more of the nitty-gritty stuff uh, when it comes to solving some problems. So in the back part of this PowerPoint, there is a example section where we talk in more detail about the stuff that I want to uh, discuss with you. So I'm just going to bring this up a little higher, or closer as you can see. So this one basically says that, um, OK, so here's the example. A small ball of mass m is suspended from a string of length l. The ball revolves with constant speed v in a horizontal circle of radius r. So this is this, this diagram we saw here of this conical shape that it creates. The reason why it's a conical shape is because, again, it's tethered to the top and then it rotates kind of, you know, down below to create almost like this phantom co cone shape, right? We talked about it being like a tether ball, right, in class, right, kind of like that. And, um, and that's what it does. So it sweeps around the surface of the cone and the system is known as a conical, conical pendulum. Uh, find an expression for V in terms of the geometry in figure 6.3. So here's 6.3. And an expression for V means I want to find the velocity. I want to find the velocity uh, relative to the, the, the um, this problem here, right? So what do I do? So first of all, we conceptualize. So imagine the ball, right? We want to draw the um, free body diagram, right? And notice that there is a couple ways to do this. That's why they show these two uh, points here, right? One point is you see that there's an angle that kind of goes towards um, the tether, wherever that is, right? So you can definitely know that that's the length, and there's, there is some force going across, or tension, tensile force, going across the tether to wherever it's tethered to, right? And some angle theta. That's the first thing we get in, in, um, in part A. Um, and then we see that there's something else in part B where we see that there is some kind of, again, gravity, and um, we're trying to compartmentalize this ten tensile force into two uh, components, right? We've got the tensile force that we see, cos theta for the, um, and this is strange again, for the x component, which is usually in the, in the x coordinate space. And this time it's looking like it's the y coordinate space. And then we got t sine theta for in the x coordinate space. If I was looking at this as the x direction is this, and this is the y direction, when normally these two are flipped. And the reason why this is happening again is because of our lovely uh, circular motion, which causes these to flip around. So that's what this is. This is finding the components of this system here. So we conceptualize, we, we kind of draw our feed body diagram, we draw what components we need, and then we also have, we try and write down all of our knowns and unknowns, and then we get right into analyzing how to fix this problem. So we know the sum of all forces across the y-axis, because it's in equilibrium, um, as an example, are equate to zero, right? So again, we've broken down the component forces, so cos theta, Right? So again, I'm going to go back up to the other diagram here so you can see that cos theta is in the up and down. Um, we, we calculate cos theta up and down in this particular case for the cone shaped um, examples, right? And um, we take cos theta and we subtract gravity, mass times gravity, and that's got to be zero because the ball isn't going up and down. It's just staying around this circular course, right? And so that we know that. That's one of the, the uh, examples, you know. So when we create uh, equation one, we just rearrange these things. We don't have a negative sign. And we want to kind of put things in terms of um, one variable. So T cos theta is equal to the mass of gravity. We know that those two things are correct. Excellent. And now we want to find all the forces across the x-axis. So this, these are the sum of all forces across the y-axis. And now we want to try and find all the sum of all forces across the x-axis. And this is where it becomes, um, again, a component. So we say T sine theta. And this is where we use centripetal force. Say so T sine theta, the forces are equal to mass times acceleration. We don't know the acceleration. We want to break it down in terms of uh, velocity, because that's what we've been asked to do. 
right? So we can say that uh, T sine theta then is equal to mass times velocity squared over R. So we don't have A, we have velocity and we have radius, right? And if I go back up, you can see that we have some kind of radius right here. And we want to find the components, the component forces. We want to use them to find the other information. Okay, so we've broken this out. And we said that T sine theta is equal to mass times acceleration, which is equal to, and this is centripetal acceleration, which is then just equal to, if we replace centripetal acceleration with V squared over R, we get this equation. T sine theta is equal to mass times V squared over R, right? And then what we get is, notice that um, we've got sine theta and we've got cos theta, right? And one is saying mg, here's mg. And the other one is m times v squared over r. And if we take cos theta over sine theta, right, you can see that the t's, if we subtract, if we kind of divide one over the other, we get a ratio. We can see that the t's disappear. Cos over sine, um, that's not really tangent, it's really the other way around, it's sine over cos, right? But what happens is the mass cancels out, right? Mass cancels out, and we get this idea of, um, we're multiplying uh, the radius times gravity, mass is gone, right? And then, so it's V squared, so V squared over radius times gravity is equal to tan theta. So. This is good because we're trying to figure out, we're trying to isolate V squared. And this is the system that they're doing. They're taking the second equation, which is in terms of sine, and putting it over the first equation in terms of cos to get this ratio of tan theta. We know sine over cosine is equal to tangent, right? And then once we've got that, we've put tan theta in terms of V squared over RG. Now we want to isolate for V squared. So we take, or for V actually, so we take, uh, RG, and we multiply it by both sides. So it's RG tan theta over RG over RG. We RG cancels out, which we get V squared is equal to RG tan theta. And if we want to find V, we take the square root of RG tan theta. And that's the equation that we can use to find velocity based on this system. All right, now we know that radius is equal to length times sine of theta. Right, that's what that is, and that's what they've done. They've just taken radius and replaced it with length, the length of the chord, times sine theta, and we just rearrange the equation so it looks like this. And this is the final equation that you would use for um, to find the velocity when we know the length, the gravity, and the um, angle. All right. So going back up to that other thing, if I want to find velocity. Then that's what I've done. I've kind of been I've been able to find the velocity based on uh, the data that I've been given. But the first thing, the most important thing, is to isolate these two things, these components, component forces, when we know that the tension is here. So if I've been given, so imagine if we have an actual question that we've been given a, a tension along the cord, whatever that is, right? But we're asked for velocity. We say, well, what's the velocity when you have the tension? Okay, cool. And let's say we've been given the mass. But in this case, notice that the mass is irrelevant. Because if I want to find velocity, the mass gets canceled out up here when we take sine theta over cos theta to get tangent, because basically both things have mass in them, right? If you notice the equation 2 has mass times acceleration, which turns into mv squared over r, right? And if you take mass times acceleration over mass times gravity, the masses cancel out. That's what happens. Masses cancel out, right? And of course, we're going to change acceleration to v squared over r. So that's where it, when you um, you do a little bit of algebra, you get this equation here, right? All right, dudes. I'm gonna start with the rotate. That's what this my must my uh, one of my guys. All right. So there we go. So that's that's really that's how you do this conical stuff. Any questions around this? It's just using some of the, the same equations that we've shown that I've kind of shown you already. So um, where we know that um, Newtonian, when we think about the three laws of motion, force equals to mass times acceleration. We know we have some kind of force. We know we have a mass. 
we know acceleration is equal to v squared over r, the centripetal kind. And no, notice, remember that um, the acceleration goes towards the tether, this up here, right? We also know the theta angle, whatever that is. And if we know all these things, we can figure out velocity. Okay, so pretty cool. So it looks complex at first, but if we have a simple formula like that one, we can figure it out. Okay, how about this one? Um, okay, a puck of a mass of, here's an actual one, 0.5 kilograms. So 0.5 kilograms is attached to the end of a cord, 1.5 meters long. Okay, so let's write down what we know. We know that the, that the puck has a mass of 0.5 kilograms. Great, right? We know that the length of this cord, right, the length of this cord right here, right, is 1.5 meters long. So that's this cord from here, from the center outwards. All right, and the puck moves in a horizontal direction. All right, that means this way on the horizontal, not this way on the vertical. This way is vertical, this way is horizontal. When it's in horizontal space like that, it is in equilibrium. Now, we know that on the y axis, it's not going up and down. And we can assume that, that, that it's in equilibrium. And we can also assume that it's uniform motion this way because the motions going around and around are e equal approximately. If it was this way, and I was using some, if I, if I was in the vertical, it would not be uniform motion. When it's not mechanical motion, if I'm not using some kind of propeller or something else to make things go forward or um, you know, something else, it's, it's usually non-uniform motion. Now we've got a cord, and like it says, imagine whirling a bowling ball on the cord. It's that's kind of crazy. It would be, it would be really heavy. It'd probably it would probably snap off, right? Um, but this is the thing. So once we we again, they, they have these words conceptualize. Let's think about it. Let's see if we can draw the free body diagram. Um, categorize, right? We know we need some kind of uniform circular motion. We need the equations for that, and then the analyze part is well. How do I how do I use the equations that I know? And one of the equations had something to do with force equals to mass times acceleration, right? Back to Newton again. Uh, that's the second law of motion, right? T is actually a force, the tensile force. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. And acceleration in this case is centripetal acceleration. Centripetal, I'll say, I'll say that, okay? Say that a couple times fast. And then you take, uh, you convert Accelerate centripetal centripetal acceleration woo over uh, to v squared over r, and that's what gives you that AC. And going back a couple slides, just like we had um, MAC here and v squared over r, it's the same equation we're using here, right? That's what's happening. We're converting AC centripetal acceleration to v squared over r, and so once we have this. Okay, now what are we looking for? What is the what is the problem asking for? It says, if the cord can withstand a maximum tension of five, 50 newtons, that's on the cord, what is the maximum speed at which the, uh, the puck can move before the cord breaks? Assume that the string remains horizontal during the motion, which means it's in equilibrium. So we know we have a bunch of stuff. We have the, the mass, the length, and the maximum tension, right, that it can do. But we're looking for velocity. Speed, actually. So here's speed. And all we've done is we've taken this equation here, which is force, tensile force, right? Tension force equals to mass times acceleration. We replaced acceleration with V squared over R. And then we rearrange things to get V, which is speed, is equal to the square root of the force of tension times the, the, uh, the radius of the cord over the mass. And then we just sub in, right? We sub in, and what we're doing is, this is the velocity max because we know that beyond this point, if we went beyond this velocity, it would snap the cord, right? That's how it works. So we sub in 50 newtons for the total force. That's the tensile, the maximum tensile force. All right, that's the fastest it can go. Beyond that tensile force, it'll just snap off and fly all over the place. And that's why we put the 50 in there. Otherwise, we wouldn't know. Going back to the, the problem question, we don't know what this tensile force is right? But once it gives us 50, we know that's going to be the maximum tensile force for the maximum speed. That's what it tells us, right? Okay, cool. We take that, multiply it by the length, the, the radius of the cord, 1.5 meters, over the mass, which is 0.5 kilograms, to give us 12.2 meters per second is the mm -hmm. velocity. Now, if you have the velocity and if you want to find the acceleration, 
you multiply the velocity or you you uh, uh, square the velocity and divide it by the radius, and then you'll get the, acceler the centripetal acceleration. Okay. So that's how you do um, this type of question, where you have some kind of object on the horizontal, and um, you want to find um, the velocity. OK, cool. What about if you have this idea? So 1,500 car, uh, kilogram car moving on a flat horizontal road negotiates a curve as shown. Okay, here it is. If the radius of the curve is 35 meters, right? So now again, between here and this, and this, uh, this curve is drawn, assuming that this is part, one part of the circle. There's a radius that goes from the center of wherever the rotation is to the car. And that's what that um, radius is, 35 meters. And the coefficient of static friction between the tires and dry pavement is 0.523. Remember I told you last time, I wouldn't make you figure this out, right? But how I would probably give you this, this thing. So what is the total friction force then? If the coefficient of static friction is 0.523, who cares what type of what type it is? We know that the normal force is based on uh, 1,500 kilograms, right? That's what it is, times, and that's how we're trying to figure it out. Uh, so mass times acceleration, mass times acceleration is that normal force. So we would multiply 1,500 times 9.8. Let's see if we can do that. A little calculator. If I said 1,500 uh, kilograms times 9.8, right? That's the normal force, 14,700 newtons. And I want to multiply that by the static force of friction, right? Which is we just got this. Um, the coefficient right here, right? So the coefficient of static friction is 0.523, and that causes, that's the total amount of acceleration. So times 0 0.523, right? And that gives us 7,688.1 newtons of force going this way. That's what's push pulling the car in towards the center because that's how these curved surfaces work, right? Now this is not a banked curved surface, this is a flat curved surface. And for that one, we know that that's the force going this way. Well, if we know the force and we know the, the, the um, we can figure out the acceleration, right? And from there, we can figure out everything else. So find the maximum speed. Speed, right, is we want to find acceleration, which is V squared over R. And that's part of the stuff we want to find. So let's go back to conceptualize. So conceptualize, imagine the road. We draw a free body diagram like this. We know that the force of friction is going to be equal to the normal force times the coefficient of friction, static friction. That's what that is, right? So we draw the free body diagram. And then we start writing the numbers down. And notice what I talked about, which is 0.523 times 9.8, right? And that's the total. Now, what they've done is interesting. They waited to substitute all that stuff in until the end. So what we say is the force, the static force max right, is equal to the, the um, coefficient of friction that we've been given times the normal force, which is what I uh, kind of generated already, right? And that equals to mass times acceleration, right? Remember, mass times V squared over R. If it's centripetal force, acceleration is equal to V squared over R. So that's what we've got this situation happening. And we know that on the forces on the y-axis, right, are zero because it's not going to fly up or down. So we know that, you know, the normal force minus the, the force of gravity is equal to zero. We can say that then the normal force is equal to the, the force of gravity, right? Which is force of gravity times the mass. That's what the normal force is. And once we have that information, we can say, well, once we start rearranging this, this kinds of stuff, right? We can see that the maximum velocity, this is the equation one, this is the equation two, right? Maximum velocity, we're solving for maximum velocity anyway. We just rearrange these things to say that is equal to the coefficient of friction times the normal force times the radius. How are we getting radius? Because force equals to ma, r, v squared over r, right? Over the mass. So how did I derive that? Well, we have two equations, right? So here's that first one. Coefficient of friction, right, times normal force. We found that the normal force equals to the, the force of gravity. So we just substitute, take force of gravity and put it into there. So it's 
uh, mu or mu times the force of gravity. That's what it is, right? But it's equal to, right? It's equal to mass times acceleration. That's what this is, v squared over r, right? So if you take the mg and put it in there and you divide both sides uh, by mg, you can actually eliminate, which is kind of what they did later on, you can eliminate m altogether, right? And you're going to multiply something by, when you, when you divide both sides by, um, uh, or by m, you get, there's no m, right? And n then is mass times gravity, right? But we know what n is just gravity at the end. We don't care about mass. So mu times gravity, right, is what we have, which is equal to the v squared over r, right? And once you rearrange that stuff, you get something like this, where v max, when you isolate for v, v max equal to uh, the coefficient of friction times gravity times the radius. And that's why they got this thing. And it's the square root of this, of course, to find v, right? And then once they've done that, they figure out that velocity maximum is equal to 13.4 meters per second. It's not really that clear when you look at this thing, but all they've done is they've, re they've rearranged the equation. Now, what would, how would I do it differently? How would I do it differently? I'm looking for velocity, right? And I already know that the values that I got, I've got this, these values up here. I got 7,688.1 newtons. No, normally what I did was I took the mass and I multiply. So I've got this total force, right? But what they figured out was, wait, you don't even need the mass because they took the mass out, right? But even so, if I've got this force and I've got the mass and I want to find acceleration, right, whatever that is, right, I take this and take, I want to find, find acceleration, I take this and divide it by my mass. And if I divide it by 1,500 grams or kilograms, I get some value 5.1254, right? And that's the velocity. Um, that's what I. That's what I have. That's that's equal to my acceleration. Sorry, that's equal to my acceleration. Now, when I have this, I know this is equal to v squared over r. I know the radius, right? I'm just doing it the other way around. I know the radius because if I go up, slide, the radius is 35 meters, right? The radius is 35 meters. So I go back to this. I'm just doing it a different way. So this is equal to uh, v squared over 35. If I want to get rid of the 35, I multiply by 5.12. So multiply by 35, which is equal to 179, 3.389. And then I want to take the square root of this to get v. Okay, let's see if we get the same number. 13.393, same numbers. Again, all I'm doing is using force equals mass times acceleration to figure that out. Okay. And we got that first because we know to figure out the normal force or to figure out the, uh, the friction force, right? The static force of static friction, we take the normal force, which is whatever gravity is, mass times gravity, that's the normal force, and we multiply it by the coefficient of friction, static friction, which is, and this, they gave it to us at points 5, 2, 3, right? And that's how we get that number. They just did it in a different way. They removed m a mass altogether, which we ended up doing anyway. Okay, so that's what the, um, that's how they did this, solve this one. This is one of the easiest ones to, to solve because it's very, very straightforward. This is the classic one, and this is actually on your assignment, okay? So in this case, it says a child of mass M rides on a Ferris wheel, as shown. Now, in your assignment, you have the mass. I think I gave it to you as 35 kilograms or something like that, right? Okay, the child moves in a vertical circle of radius 10. This, again, Ferris wheel is an example of uniform circular motion because it's mechanical motion, right? It's not me with my, uh, with my rope swinging something around. If I did that, that's not uniform because as I swing down, there's more force coming on the downstroke than there is coming up. If I go up, right, the force of gravity is pulling me down. But if I come down, just like I'm bowling, there's more force coming down this way, right? And that's what, what's the difference. Now here, what you're getting is uniform circular motion because it's mechanical, because the Ferris wheel is slowly, slowly turning things, right? However, there's still forces playing on the car where the child is in, right? When you're at the bottom, there's more forces pulling down. When you're at the top, there's a different kind of force. And it, and it differentiates that. And one of the things that I ask you to do in the assignment is tell me where all the forces are. And there's 
a couple of positions here. There's the top position, there's the bottom position, there's the horizontal on the right, and there's the horizontal on the left. Those four positions, I ask you to describe them, right? All right, so the child moves in a vertical circle of radius 10. You know this is 10 meters. This is how big the, the, um, uh, the Ferris wheel is. At a constant speed, that's up here, right, of 3 meters per second. That's what this is. So this rotates 3 meters per second. What if I had given you, instead of 3 meters per second, what if I had given you revolutions per minute? Could you figure out, you know, as an example, what the speed would be from revolutions per minute? Think about this. If I said it's traveling um, at 25 RPM, revolutions per minute, it's the Ferris wheel, right? How would I find the speed from that? Distance traveled, this many revolutions, over time. Distance over time is velocity, yeah? Sorry? That's very good. It would be, it would be angular because it's going this way, right? As it's turning, is the, 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 the rotations per minute, it's angular, right? Angular momentum. But I can find rotations, I can use rotations per minute, right, to figure out the speed. And the other way around, if I want to find how many rotations does it do, do every, if I know I have a constant speed of three meters per second, right, as it goes this way, three meters per second, and how, you know, how many rotations does, does it do per minute, I would take this three meters per second, multiply it by 60, right? Rotations per minute. Second, this is in seconds. And that would be how many rotations, right? Now, based on, of course, how big the thing is, and there's an actual formula for that. All right, so let's, uh, we'll, and we'll handle that when, we, when it comes to uh, circular momentum, which is totally different than this. All right, so, but we have this idea of the velocity, three meters per second over here, right? And we have the radius. That's good. We, have, we know that the acceleration is actually equals to V squared over R. That's what we know. We know that. Now, what does this thing ask us to get? Determine the force exerted by the seat on the child at the bottom of the ride, right? So there's, we want to try and draw this uh, free body diagram, right, where we have mass times gravity here, and then the normal force coming up, the normal force that is where the seat, where the child is sitting, right? The child is sitting, there's a normal force pressing up, right? Okay, and it says determine the force exerted by the seat on the child at the bottom of the ride. Express your answer in terms of weight of the child. Well, we know that the the weight of the child is uh, because we, have, we we don't know what the mass is. It doesn't give us the mass, but it's giving us other things, it's giving us the speed and the radius. All right, and it says um, in terms of the weight of the child, mass times gravity. Okay, no problem. Let's see how this goes. So. Now, this is a big conceptualization, but basically what, what it talks about is, if you read it, it says um, you would expect to feel heavier at the bottom of the path, right, than you do at the top. Because at the top of the path, what's happening is you're, you're actually raising out of the path. It's trying to push you out, out of the seat, right? When that's why you have seatbelts on those bloody things, right? Especially if they go really fast. Same thing with a roller coaster. That's another classic example. And we're going to talk about roller coaster when it comes to energy systems, which is where we're going to start. I think we're going to start that next week where we kind of talk about how as the roller coaster goes up and down, you have a circular motion again, because this there's a circular motion on the way up, there's a circular motion on the way down, right? And what's happening is on the way up, you want to leave your seat. And that's what we get a little bit. If, you're, if you've ever gone to Canada's Wonderland, now they actually have seatbelts. In my day, they didn't, they just had that bar, right? Um, and if you're on an old roller coaster like Mindbuster, right? You want to, it feels like you're going to fly out of your seat, right? Because the bar is just holding you there, right? And the reason for that is at the top, it's projecting you up almost like a projectile. It's almost like you're, it's projecting you up. But what's happening is the roller coaster is being held together by the centripetal force. It's pulling down. So what's happening is you get an upwards force to your body when at the top. And as you come down, you feel like, you know, there's a lot of forces coming down at you. Why? Because the same direction, that you're traveling in the same direction as the velocity. The velocity is going down, the, the gravity is coming down, and you're being pulled down twice. Once from the velocity, once from gravity. And that's why you feel heavier. It's a, it's a perception uh, when you're at the bottom. Why? Because there actually are forces towards the bottom of the roller coaster or the bottom of the Ferris wheel in this case. All right, so what do we do? We break it down. And one of the things they talk about here is we draw a diagram of the forces acting on the child at the bottom of the ride okay, as shown, we, a free body diagram. And the only forces acting on him are the downward gravitational force and the upward 
uh, normal force at the bottom, okay, exerted by the seat. The net upward force in the child that provides the centripetal acceleration has a magnitude of the net bottom minus uh, minus gravity times mass. Why is that? Right, because remember, centripetal acceleration goes towards the center of the of the object, right? So that's where the acceleration goes to. And we know that it has a magnitude of the normal force minus the the uh, um, um, the mass of gravity. So what's the normal force of the boy? Well, we know we don't know what the ma his mass is, but we know that the mass the his mass times gravity. Gravity is nine point eight. We know that. Now, eventually, I think we can remove gravity in some in some cases, but not here. Here, what we want to say is the net the sum of all forces, right? which is towards the middle, the acceleration towards the middle is the, the normal force in the, on the bottom minus the, the, uh, the boy's mass times gravity, which is equal, that's the force, which is equal to mass, his mass again, mass on both sides, times velocity squared over R, right? We have the velocity, we have the, the, uh, the radius, so that uh, ratio we already have, okay, if we want to sub it in here. And then we can find uh, the other things we don't know. Okay, let's keep going. So now what they've done is they've they've solved for the normal force on the bottom. That's what they've done. So normal force on the bottom, they've just taken that mass uh, times gravity and put it on the other side. So instead of a negative, it becomes a positive. That's what they've done here in this step, right? And then we still know that it's ma time plus mass. So mass, gravity, plus mass times velocity squared over R, right? And then what they've done is they've pulled mass time, uh, and gravity out Right? They said, okay, we're going to pull this out. And notice that what's happening is when they do that, when they divide by G, right, you have this equation here. Right? Now, I wouldn't have never thought to do this myself. If I was looking at this, I would have been, hmm, I would have pulled mass out. Because right? you can factor out mass in the first equation. You notice that mass times gravity plus mass times velocity squared over R. I would have pulled mass out. And then I would have got mass times 1 plus V squared over R. R, R right? There wouldn't have been any gravity in there because it's not a common factor. It's not like you can divide by both, but you can. And what they've done is they've left it so that you're dividing um, by both uh, objects by uh, by gravity, which allows you to do this. Now, you're still multiplying by gravity, and it's, all it is is canceling it out. So it's like, almost like you're adding one, right? But I would never have done that myself. I've never, I've, when I did it, I would have done it a different way. Well, even if we did it my way, where well, we didn't uh, multiply by gravity, right? And we have mass times gravity on the outside, as an example, right? Notice that um, it says we want to express this weight in terms of mass times gravity, and that's what this thing means. It's kind of, in my opinion, a little bit uh, convoluted the way they did that. But why? Why do they do that? They did it because of this hint, where it says express your answer in terms of weight of the child, mg. So how many mass gravities, his mass times gravity, how many of those are you going to feel on the bottom? This is how many Gs he's feeling. Remember the idea of Gs? G-force. You know, when you're in a, when you're some kind of um, um, jet plane and they talk about if you, you know, as you, you know, kind of dive, you do a dive, you feel G-forces coming at you. Why? Because you're accelerating downwards plus there's the force of gravity right, on that plane, and you feel this G-force, especially when you come back up again, right, because what you're doing is you're fighting the G-force as you're being pressed back into your seat, because now gravity is pulling you down, but at the same time, you're, you're, uh, uh, you're pushing up, and it's, uh, it, it, it kind of increases the feeling of how, how, how heavy you feel, how massive you feel. That's what G-force is all about. And they have these G-force, uh, um, you know, uh, these, ca these couches, right, and what they do is these, these um, you know, but they, they cancel out some of this this force. So these, when the fighter pilot's inside of his cockpit, he's got a special chair, he's strapped down, right? And he's got a special suit too, so that he doesn't feel it. Like that suit that he, they, they, that those, the fighter pilot wear isn't just for him to, to survive um, in low oxygen levels, but also to cancel out some of that, uh, the force that he's feeling. All right, so that's really cool. So that's 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 what's happening here, and we're, we're expressing it in terms of mg, and that's how you get to it. We're doing it because they're removing when when you factor it out, you're also dividing by thing because you want to isolate mg. You want to do it in terms of of mass times gravity, 
right? And that's what we're doing. So we don't know the mass of the boy. If we knew the mass of the boy, we can totally, uh, you know, kind of calculate it in terms of how many Gs of force there are, right? How many gravities? Five gravities, two gravities. In this case, it's 1.09 gravities. A little bit more heavier than you normally would feel. Almost 10% heavier, he feels, at the bottom of the, of the Ferris wheel. Because as it comes down, we're adding his mass, uh, or we're adding the force or the velocity to the, um, uh, to the Ferris wheels, um, or to the gravity of the boy. And the gravity, compare, uh, can, you know, kind of multiplied by his mass. Okay, that's what this does. How else could you figure this out? Um, because we've been given this. We've, given, we've been given this kind of equation. If you notice at the top here, when we're talking about uniform motion, I'm just going to go back to, the, to this example, the Ferris wheel. And this is where it is. You notice that we have, we've been given some equations. And here's the equation that we get. Um, this comes right from the, the lecture slides, right? This comes from the equation that we get right here. So we didn't have to figure this out if we really didn't want to. We just can take this um, equation that we've been given, right? So normal force at the bottom is equal to mg. And we, we want to do it in terms of mg, so we just solve for this. That's all we're doing here. That's exactly what was done. Right, this is in your lecture slides, right? So if you couldn't figure it out, if you couldn't derive it yourself, they just derived it for you, okay? But the idea is to put it in terms of, hey, you know what? We know that at the bottom of the of the uh, um, of the Ferris wheel, we're going to have the situation where it's normal force at the bottom minus mass times gravity is equal to mv squared over r, and when you rearrange all that, you get this, okay? All right, so that's the kind of uh, very common equation that you're going to get. We got that one. We got we did this one, and we did this one, and this one. Those are the things we got, right? Okay, cool. So we figured this one out. Now I believe there is a part B to this one. Here, here's the part B. So part B is determine the force exerted by the seat on the child at the top of the ride. So this is the other side. Well, what are we going to do? We're going to take the other equation we've been given. Right, which is uh, n top, right, is equal to mg times 1 minus v squared over rg. And if you don't believe me, you can look at the lecture slides way up here where we talk about uh, this stuff here. So this is the bottom, and then here's the top, right? mg times v squared over rg minus 1. That's where we, that's where we know that's what the n top is. All right, so that's, the, that's that part 2 that we're talking about, right? Oops. And is that the same one? Yep. We want this one. We want part B. This is part B. So once we have that, that, that equation, we know that n top is equal to this, right? And now we just sub in. So we know that V squared, so 3 meters per second squared, and then over the radius, which is 10 meters, times 9.8 meters per second squared, which is the gravity. And then we know in terms of mass times acceleration or mass times gravity, at the top, he he feels that it's only 90% of his body mass, right? Because of the feeling he gets, right? He's being pulled down by gravity, but he's being thrown up by the acceleration of the of the uh, um, uh, the centripetal, sorry, the um, tangential forces that he's feeling that are pulling him across or outside of his seat, right? So he feels lighter at the top and heavier at the bottom. Okay, guys, I've almost done your assignment number, you know, one of your questions on assignment number two, right? Now you just have to figure out the numbers. Your numbers are going to be different than mine, okay? But I wanted to put this out because this is the confusing part. Students get this weird, you know, idea that they don't know how to do the question, and it's just right here. Okay. Um, and here's your last one. This is the last thing I want to talk about today, and we can go for the day. We can also use this time if you want to work with your partner on the on your assignment number one or assignment number two. You can certainly do that, or you can work in lab on something else. But I wanted to talk about this last uh, problem here. All right, so a small sphere of mass m is attached to the end of a cord of length r. Okay, so we know the length, cord length, all right, and um, and set into motion in a vertical circle. Once you know that I've got a cord in a vertical circle, it means this way. You know it's non-uniform motion. That's what I'm talking about because I'm doing this, I'm accelerating on the bottom, and I'm 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 decelerating on the top which means that my motion, the constant rate of speed, not the same, non-uniform motion, right? And then we have a sub, another set of equations for that. Okay, so what does it need? It says, 
um, determine the tangential acceleration of the sphere and the tension in the cord at any instant. When I hear any instant, I'm here. I'm thinking of calculus in my mind, right? Instantaneous velocity, right? That's what I'm thinking. Instantaneous velocity or instantaneous acceleration. That to me sounds like calculus, right? And I can derive that if I have velocity. We can check that too. All right. Um, so this is the the situation that I've got here, and it goes. Uh, and they say that. Um, any instant when the speed of the, of the sphere is V and the cord makes an angle theta with the vertical. All right, so conceptualize. Uh, we figure out that this is not uniform acceleration. We talked about that. Uh, we model, model the, the sphere, right? And we know that at any point, this point right here compared to this point right here, there's a difference between when we come from here to here, right? Okay. It says that determine the tangential acceleration of the uh, of the of the sphere and the tension in the cord at any instant when the speed of the sphere is v, and the cord makes an angle theta. So here's how you find the angle theta. This is the angle theta we're talking about, right? From the bottom of the cord, right over to here, whatever that angle theta is, right? And what we want to do is we want to find out because um, this is kind of this can be a complicated problem at all uh, as well. But they simplify it for us, right? They know we, we use that, um, we know that force is equal to mg sine theta, right? And that's part of our, what we, we, we learned earlier on in our lecture slides, right? So, because that is the, um, all the forces, the, the, tension, the tension force, right, across the cable. That's what it is, right? So that's the, the tension force, mg sine theta, which is equal to mass times acceleration. The acceleration across the the centripetal acceleration across that the the um, uh, that we're that we're getting there from the tangential forces that's a totally different thing. So notice they broke it down here. They said so force of gravity is equal mass of mass times gravity exerted by the Earth and the force T exerted by the cord. That's the cord from the from the where the object is to the center. That's what that is, right? And then we resolve force of gravity into tangential components, mg sine theta, and a radial component of main mg cos theta. OK, let's take a look at that. What do you mean by tangential and radial, right? So here's mg sine theta, mg cos theta, right? This is radial. This is tangential, OK? That's what that is. So it breaks down the, the, uh, the components of the forces, right? And once we have those two forces, we can say that the acceleration, the tangential acceleration, is then equal to uh, g sine theta. Notice that we've just eliminated the mass because there's mass on both sides, right? mg sine theta is equal to mass times acceleration, right? So we take mass, mass, eliminate it. So it doesn't matter about what mass it is. And now we have acceleration is equal to g sine theta, right? And that is for the, the tangential forces, the forces on the tangent, right, to the curve. Uh, to give us that acceleration, um, the tangential acceleration. It's kind of hard to say tangential, but that's what it is. And then we have the sum of all forces, right? We can use the same kind of idea, right? Where the, on the, the, the wire, so we want to find the forces on, the, on the, the tensile forces on the wire. And we know that uh, from our equations that um, we know that T minus mg cos theta is equal to mv squared over r, and then we want to find t, so we isolate it. We just rearrange the equations again, okay? Where t is equal to mg v squared over rg plus cos theta. And where is this? This is in our in our lecture slides again. If you look up to the to the non-uniform motion, so this is how we solve the equation, right? That's how we do it. And I think it's important for you guys to know those cases. The reason why I bring bring this up is those are the most common cases you might see on the test, and you're going to see some of this on your assignment. Right? So what I recommend you start doing is thinking about, take a look at your assignment, start, you know, blocking it out. I want you to draw your free body diagrams. That's what I've asked you to do over and over again, because on the test, we're going to have a number of free body diagrams you're going to have to identify. Which one is the right free body diagram? This one, this one, this one, or this one. Which one is it? Right? And you're going to decide. You're going you're gonna to choose that one. And it's going to be based on, an, on on a question. All right? So whatever that question is. Like, for example, if I said that, you know, draw the free, select the free body diagram for the, um, in this particular case, when the ball is at the lowest point, right? Then you'd want to draw something like this, right? 
we want to select that that's the free body diagram why is that the free body diagram well because we have at the bottom mass times gravity in fact mass times gravity has got to be in all of them right? no matter which one you draw if i say at the top this is what the top looks like this is what the bottom looks like this is what any other point on the curve looks like right and then you should know what these why it is the way it is well why is it this way well we know that right we know that there is tangential acceleration that goes across this one this is the tangential acceleration part right we know that there's also centripetal acceleration that's going towards the middle right this force that that's pulling in this tension force if you will that's pulling towards the middle of the of the cable right well notice the tension force is here at the bottom and here pointing down at the top but there's less of it there's less of it because of the forces pulling outward and if you actually were to figure this out by doing this by finding the um uh you know by uh, by determining this kind of stuff here like where you say okay well i've got this force and i've got uh this tangential force over here well you notice that there's another force that goes this way which is not the same as as pointing all the way down right and then because this other force that's in the middle, because you just Pythagorean theorem tells you there's going to be a force that goes this way inside the, inside the circle, right? Once you know that, then you know that at the top, there's less forces pulling down than there are across, right? We talked about that last week, where the energy is going, where the energy is going not all fully down because of tangential forces pulling it across, right? So because of that, if there's going to be less ten uh, tension force going down, right, than there is here. Right? There's more tension, tension force going up in this particular case because there's nothing to stop it right, from doing that on the downward swing. And then you have this example where mg must be equal to this, right? Because on the downward swing, you have, you have both of those forces happening, right? Here you have you know, the force that's coming down plus, plus this other force down here and then this other force that's pulling you down, all right? So that's how it's working. It looks kind of inverted. It's almost like you'd, you'd expect that the top would be at the bottom and the bottom would be at the top. Be careful when you select the diagram, right? And the same thing goes with um, when I talk about uniform motion. So here what we've done is there's, there, you can actually physically draw two different diagrams. This diagram here, the one, the one at the bottom uh, for free body diagram, if you notice, I'm talking about how to figure out the normal force, right? We can figure out the normal force right because we're going to take a look at mass times gravity right and the car is not sinking into the ground if the car was sinking into the ground then this normal force would be would, wouldn't be able to support the car right but the car is not sinking into the ground it's staying on top of the, the concrete which means the normal force is equal to mass times gravity it's just in opposition well now that i know what the normal force is i can get the the force of friction static force of friction because i have the coefficient of friction whatever they gave us 0.5 something so I take the normal force times the coefficient of friction to find out this. And we know that the, the frictional force is uh, perpendicular to the normal, right? So if the normal force is like this, the frictional force is this, this way, going towards the middle um, you know, of, the, uh, of the curve, wherever the curve is, right? So, I mean, if I was going to get you to draw this, again, select the free body diagram, what would it be, right? And they continue with some other ones. I want to show you these ones. This is another situation here where you have... The fourth, the tension force going towards the middle, right? The tension force going towards the middle, right? So you're going to see some of that on a test. Here's some other ones, right? Some other ones where you have a free body diagram. How would you draw it? Select the right free body diagram. Now, someone asked me earlier, is there a free body diagram maker or drawer for your assignment? I mean, you can use any tool you want, but if I was, let's just, let's just, you know, do this thing. We'll we'll Google it and see if there's anything out there. Um, I never saw anything specifically for free body di uh, diagram drawing, but let's take a look. So let's say if I say free, oop, not free, free body diagram. Well, there's a free di body diagram maker. I don't know what that is. I've never seen this before, so I don't know what it is. Okay, it's draw draw.io. There we go. Right, and this free body diagram interactive. Right, so. Hmm, how does this work? And then you start, and I'm sure there's some kind of questions it's going to ask you uh, to make this all work. So here's situation number one. I don't know what that is, but it probably tells you, right? Oh, uh, a rightward force supply to create a, uh, to a crate to push it across the floor at a constant speed. Ignore air resistance. How would I draw this thing? Let's do some of these, right? 
That's neat. So a right word force, it says, right word force. That means I'm probably going to draw something like this, some kind of, you know, uh, thing that goes this way, right? So it says select the bottom and add or remove or change of force. So right, okay? Identify the right word force. Is it applied? Is there air resistance? Is there spraying? Like there's a bunch of stuff in here. It says a right word force is applied. Well, okay. <laughs> that makes pretty, sen pretty much sense, right? And F applied. Okay, cool. Um, it says to push, the, to push it across the floor at a constant speed. Ignore air resistance. Well, we also have a downward force, right? And what is that? Gravity. We know that's the case for sure. So that's part of it, right? And then we also have an upward force. Okay, we have an upward force, right? And then that's the normal. That's the normal force. We're drawing a free body diagram, right? And then at a constant speed, ignore air resistance. Okay, we don't know that there is any kind of force of friction. It didn't talk about force of friction, so I'm not going to say anything, right? Now, I don't know if this is right because I don't know what they're expecting, but this is the way you would kind of draw a free body diagram. There's nothing wrong with drawing that square. That square is also a common way of doing it. So what you're doing is you draw the dot and then arrows where the forces go, right? Okay, cool. So that's really this in a, in a nutshell. I mean, it does help you out. I'm not sure what you do from here. I wonder if you can make this a little bigger. Yeah, you can. And select and then use the check button to evaluate your 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 thing below. Where's oh check? Leave it there. Oh, sorry, your free body gram is not correct. Okay, what did I miss? Let's try it again. What did I miss here? Because I got the force of gravity, force normal, and then force applied applied to create to push it across the floor. Right at a constant speed. That's what I would draw. That's what I would draw here. Check again. Right. And I guess you could take some of these away to check it out. Um, I oh, sorry. Duh. It says identify the upward force. It just says that. Right. The upward force. That's what I'm trying to do here. So I wonder if I can clear one of the forces. Because that would be it. Force is normal is what is what it is. Right. And then if I put none, go force the normal force that's going on. Oh, that's it. Force right. There's no left force because there's no nothing on the left, and I guess I could clear the right. Uh, but we know that there's a force on the right. We know there's a force of gravity. We know there's a force normal. This is the right one, but I don't know what they're asking here. So, but at least this is not a drawer. This is you having you kind of getting help to see what it well how to do those. Um, software to draw free body diagrams and vector diagrams. Okay, let's see if they've got some stuff online. Nope, that's just a question to do it. I wonder if I can do it um, online. Scientific Gravity Maker. All right, let's see if that's, okay, I can, is that a download? Yeah, that's a download uh, online. Kind of help you out, right? No, I keep saying draw.io, but there might be something else. It takes us back to here. I wonder if that, oh. Oh, okay, here it's actually a PowerPoint on how to do it. So they tell you how to draw a, a free body diagram from the from a PowerPoint, which is kind of neat. And they, they probably tell you how to draw the diagram here. This is kind of neat. Horse, buggy, tension, strength. And then what? Did I was I too lazy to or too I was too long. Yeah, okay, there you go. Force applied and force of gravity. Right? That's if the body diagram looks like this. So that's not it. Um, Lucid chart. I guess you could use that. Um, online free body diagram creator. Concept draw. Okay, let's try that out. La, la, la. How to draw physics. Get my concept draw software. It's not online. Okay, so that didn't work. Create leak online diagram software to draw flow charts, UML, and more. Let's try draw.io because draw.io may have something that does that. Um, save two diagrams here. I'll Google Drive. Okay. Uh, sure. Yes. Create a new diagram. All right. So layouts, flowcharts, software. I'm trying to help you out here. A Venn diagram, engineering maybe. It's not layout or flowcharts. Um, no. This is neat for drawing circuit diagrams. That's neat. But there's nothing here about other. Oh, flowcharts, software. No, nope. I wouldn't say it's software anyway, but yeah, so there isn't anything. <laughs> Not specifically. It's other kind of diagrams, but uh, nothing that looks like what we what we need. So let's go back there. So that's not that's draw.io. 
And I believe Lucid Charts, is that the same thing? Log in. Yeah, we're not going to log in. I don't feel like logging in there. Um, let's talk about Creately. Maybe you guys can find something too. Creately looks like some kind of. Okay, let's try Creately now. I'm trying to help you out here. That's all. Otherwise, again, you could draw it on your own. But, um, okay, notes, property, share, publish, and we have some girls and shapes and arrows and people. Uh, basic shapes, stars, and balloons. Again, I mean, you can do this with Word if you really wanted to. And arrows, but these are pretty ugly, and some basic shapes. So, I don't know. Maybe electronic flow, diagram shapes, software, UML. Hmm. Custom libraries, electronics, scientific. There's no scientific diagram here, so I'm not sure if there's anything that applies. Maybe education? I don't know. Chemistry? Nope. Networking, shapes, software. Yeah, so I don't see anything that's here either. So, yeah, this is a bust. <laughs> so what I would, how would I do it if I was going to do your assignment? I would probably um, you know, use something like fireworks. Right, and what I would probably do is take the information and just draw arrows. I mean, a lot of these things have uh, arrow drawing anyway. Um, well, probably maybe fireworks is not the best because it doesn't have built-in arrows and all that stuff. You want to get some kind of software that has some built-in stuff to help you out. Otherwise, you're gonna have to make your arrow yourself, which kind of sucks. I mean, again, I could draw a line and then put an arrow on the end, like do one of those, and then try and figure out what the line ending in it is. I think some of these. <laughs> Some of the software has the the ending or whatever, especially uh, Illustrator and that kind of stuff. You can draw the lines and with the ending, and you want help with doing that because you know you don't want to draw your arrow yourself, right? So probably fireworks would not be good. Um, Illustrator for sure would do it for you, but I recommend something like Word. I bet you something like Word will do it for you too, if you have access to it. So let's do a blank document, and Word has great insertion capabilities for shapes. Here's some shapes, and there's some arrows. There we go. So I want to draw an arrow, right? And you can draw the arrow whatever way you like. I'm just I just draw, I drew it very badly, but let's just. Uh, well, how can you go wrong with an arrow? But Tom went wrong. All right. So then, yeah. I was, if you use if you kind of push shift, it'll put it on each of the angles here. There we go. That's for word. And then from there, what you can do is if you double click on it, um, or you can actually go through properties. If you right click, and if I go to form uh, format shape. I'm sure that it's going to give you the thickness of the line and all that kind of stuff. Like it's built into Word, right? So, uh, which is kind of cool. So here's my line. Uh, it's solid line. What's the width? I can increase the width here to make it a little bit bigger. I'm sure I can make the be the end arrow size even bigger if I if I want to. So I can make this end arrow size um, like arrow, arrow type. Here's the end arrow, arrow size. Let's make it really big. And then you got so you got some arrows, right? And that's what you probably do. It's not that difficult to do. And then if I want to kind of insert a circle or something else, uh, this is using Word, right? So let's just use I don't know, some kind of circle. And you want to make it some kind of point, because you don't, you don't want to just uh, you know, make some random points. There's my circle. I, may, I can hold the shift. It'll make perfect circles as an example. And then you can move it around wherever you like. And that's probably too big, but that's OK. Good idea. And then if I kind of uh, zoom it in a little bit so you can make it so it's a smaller circle, and then move that over here. And then you go. There you start your free body diagram, right, with force of gravity. Now, the great thing about Word is wherever you, if I was going to insert, uh, if I was going to make my free body di diagram, I would kind of insert a text box as well because text box can float all over the place. You don't have to make them follow. Sure. You don't have to make them follow, uh, you know, Word around. So, if, for example, inside my text box, if I want to put some kind of formula, I can now insert a, an equation. So let's say, and the reason why I do equations is because it, it has special symbols. So if I said, like, F, and then I want to kind of have, um, actually, let me undo that. Um, I could probably use this script. So I can go kind of force of gravity. So let's try that again. So for, oh, so I already, I already actually had it. So let's try that again. So force of gravity. So for FG, so kind of go F and then G. And then it's kind of hard to see, but you can make these bigger. And then once you've got this, uh, you can, again, design it. Once you've made one, so no line, let's say here's the line. Put this under here like this. 
Uh, this has a text fill, and why am I getting a line there? I don't want that line. Yeah. Well, the fill should be no fill. Oh, that's bad. Oh, I definitely want solid fill for there, but no line. There should be no line here. Um, I'm not sure why I'm getting that. Layout and properties. Take that. But you can see that it's not bad. I mean, it gives you a text box and kind of uh, where you want it. This isn't right, though. This You shouldn't be getting a line. And I wonder if I just double-click on the layout. That if I can get a shape outline, yeah, here it is, shape outline, and I think I can choose no outline. There we go. And then once I've got no outline, I can increase the size of this thing and increase the size of the font to make it bigger. And once I've got one thing here, um, yeah, you can kind of make it so you've got um, the beginning of a, of a free body diagram. And then you can draw, you can use, this, you can reuse part of it because there's most likely going to be force of gravity almost anything you do. So you might as well take advantage of the built-in tools. This is actually hiding part of the um, part of the arrow, but you, you might as well take advantage of the free tools are, that are available to you. If you're a student and you have access to Microsoft Word, uh, which most of you should now on the machines in front of you, even or at home, uh, then you should be able to do free, free body diagrams, no problem. If you're really a neat writer, I mean, like you're not an artist, but just you know how to make lines with rulers, you're pretty good there too. Right? I mean, it's not like that. It's rocket science, right? But just in case you want to type everything out, and a lot of people typed out their assignment number one, this is another way to do it. All right, that's really all that I have for you tonight. Again, um, I'm not trying to overload you. I'm trying to make it so that there's, you know, you get a bit of chunks of information here and there. My recommendation today is if you have your partner here today, work, start working on your assignment number two. I mean, you can get it done. You don't have to wait till the end. Right? You've got some class time to do that. If you want to work on other projects as well, you can. But uh, you get about an hour, and I can help you out. Right? So why don't you start uh, doing that? Otherwise, that's it for me from a recording perspective.